Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Rob. Let's draw Isolde. Isolde is a minor NPC from Bethesda Game Studios Skyrim. She might recall we drew another character from it in our last Let's Draw. This time around though, I'm doing a very minor character, but I've chosen her because of her distinctive look. She has very high cheekbones and a very well-defined jaw. Sort of a Olivia Wilde sort of look to her, and I really like that, so I thought, let's draw it. So right here, I'm establishing basic layout for the character, just getting a pose, simple anatomy. The character is distinctive because she's one of the few NPCs in the game that actually carries an accessory from time to time in the form of this flower basket, and I thought I should incorporate that into the overall pose. She has a very shortcut bob style haircut, swept over to one side, very easy to draw. Frames the face, so that's great for a composition like this. We can more easily, more readily draw attention to her face. So here, now that I know I've got my anatomy lined up, I'm already erasing many of my guidelines. I'm getting the basic facial, facial features down. And there's those cheekbones. When drawing a face, remember, eyes are actually halfway from the top and bottom of the head. So from the very tip top of the head to the very bottom of the chin, split that distance in half, that's where your eyes should go. Now from your eyes to the bottom of your chin, split that distance in half, that's where your nose should go. And then from the nose to the chin, split that distance in half, and that's where your mouth should go. These rules are generally always true. And something good to follow when we're very quickly hashing on character. Isolde's outfit is meant to look very medieval, very used and lived in, much like everything else in the world of the game. So she's... It was designed, I think, to imply that she has spent time repairing it, that it's torn, that she's not quite affluent, and yet... She, she's still trying to, uh, to keep, to maintain appearance, to look fashionable. So at the seams of the dress, there are these large, almost impractical stitches, which I assume aren't red, they're probably leather, so we're going to paint those rather, rather thick as single pieces rather than as a bunch of tiny threads which would be accomplished in a different way. So for now I just block them out with big black marks. Now this painting is going to have an almost monochromatic tone. It's something I decided very early on and I wanted it to feel a very particular way. So I'm painting this in a slightly different way than I normally do. I'm going to fill it in with gray tones just so I can establish values and then we'll provide a color wash later. So here I'm knocking in shadows already.
It was important that I start blocking in shadows early on with the figure so that I could use those angles to inform my lighting decisions later on with the background. As you can see, I very quickly roughed in a background using a lot of heavy dark black areas to help direct the attention back towards our figure and particularly her face, which I'm now working on. This will be the part that I spend the most time rendering because it's the part that will garner the most amount of attention. Really, whenever you're doing a character, you should spend most of your time on the face. There's just, it's what people will naturally gravitate to. They command attention in every painting they appear in, so it's very important that faces are done properly, that you take your time make sure they're as strong as they can be. Now there, I use Krita's warp tool. Slightly different from Photoshop's warp tool, in that you don't use a brush, you create a grid of control points, and then you manipulate these control points to actually alter your pixels. Effectively, it's doing the same thing behind the scenes, but Krita's implementation isn't quite as intuitive as Photoshop's. But once you understand what it's actually doing, it doesn't matter, they're all the same. I'm spending a lot of time going in and out, um, zooming back and forth as I paint this, just to make sure that I'm not fixating too much on any one particular point. When you're rendering a face, or any part of the painting really, you want to try and keep an equal amount of detail across the entire surface. You don't want to over-render one part and completely ignore another. In some cases even, it's possible to zoom in too much and include detail that can't even be seen once you actually have the painting at the resolution that it's going to be viewed at. Typically, you're going to shrink your work down by at least half of its original working size, or at least that's what you should do. You never really want to work at a one-to-one -one scale, because shrinking a, shrinking a painting down helps make your line work finer, it helps mask some of the, uh, the brushwork, unless your intent is for the viewer to see your particular brush strokes, every tiny little stray line, unless you really intend to have all of that be viewable, it's usually best to to just shrink down your work and usually I'll do it by a factor of four. But I know that not everyone has the hardware or the hard drive space or even the time to to work at such insane resolution. So at least you want to work at double the size that your final piece will be. You can see in the corner there I'm working at 8,000 by 5,000. It's not insanely huge, but it could be taxing if your computer doesn't have the RAM to support it or doesn't have the video card to push it. As ever, I'm still using a simple three lighting scenario. We've got our rim light, our fill light, and our ambient light from above. When you practice that lighting scenario enough times, you don't actually need reference even to, to think through how all the shadows work, how all the reflections work. You can just do it in your head. This isn't to say though that reference is a bad thing. It's, it's definitely very, very useful. But in terms of speed, in terms of efficiency, the more natural it is, the more you can just think through it in your head before having to jump to reference, the better. So practice, practice, practice. With characters, I typically work on the face first. 
because, like I mentioned, it, it garners so much attention, but also because I, I tend to work from the head down on characters. And I use the lighting information and the overall rendering of the head to tell me what I should be doing as I work my way down the figure. I see some artists, they like to jump around, work on whichever piece feels the most fun at the time. And I, I will do that from time to time. But generally I like to start with the face, I find myself gravitating to it the most, spending a good deal of time there, making all of my wide-ranging decisions regarding lighting, bounce lights, things like that. You don't want to be making such important decisions on, say, a belt buckle. Or later to find out that, oh, the overall environment light that I chose makes the skin look wrong, or something like that. You want to start with parts that people will see first when they glance at your work. Because the eye travels around a painting, and your lighting decisions, your composition, can all inform where that point will be. So for something like this, with this particular kind of composition, it's going to be the face, it's going to be her head. The arc of the sky versus the, the brick wall and the rotunda, the angle the tree and its branches makes, the light and shadow, it all points toward her face. So I know that when someone first looks at this work, they're going to see her head, so I needed to spend a lot of time making sure that, that looked good, that it looked correct. But your mileage may vary, and your composition could be completely different. The focal point here is the face, sure, but on your painting it may be a handgun, a sign, it might be something else, so whatever that focal point may be, render that first and let those lighting decisions, those rendering decisions, influence the rest of the painting. The last thing you really want is to have to rework a piece more than once just to try and make everything unified, to make everything look correct. Backtracking is always demoralizing. No matter how enthusiastic you are about a piece, if you have to render it three, four, five, six times, spending, you know, four, five, six, seven, eight days on it, eventually you start to run out of steam and the creativity and the drive and the passion that you had for it start to disappear. This particular piece took me about three days. I wasn't working consistently on it. Just little 30 minute snatches here and there, but I don't like to let something sit for that long simply because I already felt like my drive for it was disappearing. By the final day of this painting, I was ready to just be done with it, to move on to the next thing, because I already had so many ideas for the next things that I could paint. And that's always a bad spot. You never really want it to be that way. You want to always enjoy what you're doing. You want to be in the painting at the moment. Here, I'm just trying to fill in the areas that may be a little too dark. Just essentially bouncing out my values for the lighting that I've decided I want to use. I've got two contrasting colors, a sort of bluish light coming from the right side, and this red implied coming from a hearth fire of some sort, or a bonfire. Yeah, what would it be called if it was outside? Bonfire, I suppose. Anyway, that coming from the left. These two colors being complementary creates a nice contrast. And here I'm just filling out the sort of giving a small halo to her because I want the character to be separated from the background when I apply my depth of field blurring later on. At this point, I know that I'm going to push this background as far away as I possibly can to sort of emulate what we see in the game when you enter a conversation with a character. 
It's like the world blurs out, everything enters soft focus, and all you're really looking at is the character whose attention um, you know, you, you've, you've asked for. If you walk up and you, you talk to someone, everything else in the game sort of disappears a little bit, fades away into this colorful blob in the distance, and it helps to, to bring your attention to that character. It's a sort of cinematic technique that is used to enhance the gameplay. And I want to sort of emulate that with this painting. And when I do that sort of blurring to the background, I know that it's going to bleed a little bit into the character, so I wanted to create that small separation. It's not so important on the left, because the left is, the background is black and it's dark. So any bleeding that happens is going to be more visible from the character bleeding onto the background, which is more acceptable than the background bleeding onto the character. And since I know that I'm going to be blurring the background, I'm not putting too much detail into it, but I am making sure that my light hits on horizontal surfaces and produces enough contrast that you can still identify sort of what that object is, even though it's blurred away. Now here, I'm applying the blur. It's a Gaussian blur. All I did was duplicate what I had of the painting, put that on a new layer, and blurred it. And there, I stretched it out to hide the seams at the corners. Now I'm applying a blur to the blur just to see if that can get me a better effect at the distance. Decided that it didn't. So now I'm just blurring away, erasing away parts of the blur that cover parts that are in focus, which is really just the character. Already we're starting to get the mood that I really want. So I fill in small details in the parts of the background that are closer to the camera. And from here, it's all just rendering and establishing mood, feeling. 